Well, hello everyone. Welcome to you all to the last session of this year's Summer School by Horizon. I'm Tanisha and today I'm going to discuss with you all the theory of special relativity. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you all to Anushka who will be controlling this meet. And so any kind of issues you have or uh, just type it in the chat, she will take care of it. Okay, one more thing that I would like to mention is that uh, this session would go on till one o'clock. I guess uh, there was some miscommunication in one of the posters, so I'm just clearing it out. And now I think we are all set to start the session. Okay. I think my screen is getting shared. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So coming back to the special theory of relativity. Now, this theory is special indeed, because in order to understand it, you do not require any uh, prior knowledge of some advanced kind of mathematics. Uh, your basic knowledge of mathematics is enough to have a good understanding of it. This theory is largely built upon beautiful thought experiments, some of which we will try to recreate in this session. Uh, okay, enough of my blabbering. So let's just jump into the topic. Well, to have a good understanding of special relativity, it's really important to understand the background in which uh, this theory was introduced. Uh, so for that, we have to travel back to the year of 1880s. During this time, uh, uh, Maxwell's equation of electromagnetism were well accepted by the scientific community. And then scientists believed by then that light is an electromagnetic wave and it travels at the speed of 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second, roughly, uh, through vacuum. And now we call this SC, right? So, but, however, there was also this thing that the scientists believe, just like any other wave, light being a wave should also require some kind of medium to travel through. And this hypothetical media that uh, the scientists believe light used for traveling was named as ether. Uh, now in 1887, two scientists named Michelson and Morley uh, performed a very precise experiment to detect this media ether. Now to understand this experiment, first of all, we have to understand what do they mean by ether wind actually. Uh, well, the belief in that period of time was that the media ether was a stationary media in which all other planets, stars and everything was suspended. I mean, you can imagine it like this, that there is an ocean of ether in which all the planets and stars and everything remains suspended and keeps moving. So now we being sitting on, a, uh, on the top of a moving earth would perceive ourselves to be at rest and would, we would rather see the ether medium moving with a velocity that would be equal in magnitude to our Earth's velocity, uh, but opposite in direction. So we will perceive this ether media as a some kind of wind. And that is what has been referred as this ether wind. And that ether wind has been depicted by this small little blue arrow in this diagram. So Michelson and Morley had made this setup to detect this ether wind. In this, we have a source of light uh, and a half transparent mirror placed at an angle of 45 degrees to it. And there are two mirrors placed in this arrangement. So when rays of light reach this half transparent mirror, some of it gets reflected and strikes this ever mirror, gets reflected back and finally reaches the uh, detector. And some of the rays which reaches this half transparent mirrors also gets transmitted. And those transmitted rays then surface reflection in this mirror. And then after striking back, it reaches the detector after suffering reflection. So if we focus on these two parts that the light rays are taking, we can notice that the only difference in these two journeys that I just described comes in its travel from point A to point B. And this travel from point A to point B for the first light ray has been labeled as path one. And for the second light ray, the travel from this point A to this point B has been leveled as path two. And we are interested here to notice the difference between these two paths. Okay, so first uh, let's look at this path one, which I have drawn here. 
uh, for this we can draw an analogy of this situation with the example that i took here there is a spaceship which is traveling at the speed of light from this point a to point b and there is this ether wind from uh, that is blowing from b to a so when the flying a uh, spaceship has to go from a to b it has to move against the wind therefore it will have a resultant velocity of c minus vw and the time taken to reach from a to b would be d by c minus vw similarly in the return trip since it will be flying along with the uh, wind it will have a resultant velocity of c plus vw and the time taken will be d divided by c plus vw and so we add this times to get the time for this entire round trip and it comes out to be this again if we want to calculate the time taken for the light ray to complete this journey from a to b and back to a in this situation then we will have to make the spaceship have a velocity which should be at some angle to the horizontal because only then the resultant velocity will be in the horizontal direction so simply by pythagoras theorem we can get that this resultant velocity here will be c square minus vw square square root and so the time taken to go from a to b will be d divided by this velocity resultant velocity here you can notice that the journey from a to b is exactly same to the journey from b to a therefore uh to calculate the time for the round trip we can simply make two times of this time and we will get this time now if you look closely you can notice that these two times are not at all same so the light rays will not reach the detector at the same time there will be some time gap between the two light rays reaching the detector if the velocity of the ether wind is not zero now let's try to find out this time difference uh on calculating this time difference we will find it out to be equal to this now since i just uh, explained to you all what this ether wind is uh we by now by our reasoning we know that the velocity of ether wind will be equal in magnitude to the velocity of arch rotation and it is therefore taken as 3 into 10 to the power 4 meters per second speed of light we already know and d is the distance that uh, uh they had kept for the experiment Uh, like the distance that they had kept between a and b for performing this experiment which was equal to 11 meters and then when we put all these values in this equation we will get a time difference of something of the order 10 to the power minus of 16 seconds now this is the theoretically calculated time difference that they were expecting after the experiment now such a small time difference is really difficult to be measured right so what they did was instead of you know calculating this time difference they thought of a very clever way and they instead used the property of interference of light waves now imagine a case when there is no time difference between the two light rays reaching the detector then what will be the case then if the first ray strikes at a point the second ray will also reach the detector at the same time so one uh, ray of light i mean one wave will just sit on the top of the other i mean in this diagram i have shown some shift there will be no shift at all so one wave will just be sitting on the top of another and there will be complete constructive interference and therefore you will receive a very intense light in the detector on the other hand if there is indeed some time difference between the two light rays reaching the detector then this would result into some shift so we can safely say that this shift is somehow a measure of the time difference between the two light rays reaching the detector and now to calculate this shift precisely we have to take into account the source of the light that they had used for the experiment now they had used a sodium vapor light which has a wavelength of some 600 nanometers so we can calculate the time period it comes out to be some thing in the power 10 to the power minus 15 seconds okay before that one thing uh here like in this setup we had kept the arrangement in such a way that the direction of the ether wind was vertically downwards with respect to this setup now and for that particular setup we got a time difference of this but if somehow we adjust this arrangement of the setup with respect to the ether wind it will be possible for us to obtain a time difference of say 7 uh, into 10 to the power minus 16 seconds 
So this is the maximum time difference that we can get theoretically. So if we take this uh, time difference into account and try to calculate the expected shift, we will get it something to be of 0 0.4 approximately. So this was the expected shift that they were uh, expecting to get if the ether wind had a velocity of this. But now to their surprise, what happened after the experiment was complete bizarre. Because when they performed the experiment, they found the shift to be just 0 0.005. And this means there is an error of about 98% in the experiment. Now, such a precise experiment should not be giving such great errors. So there was something really weird about the situation, which they were not able to explain. And the experiment was indicating that the ether wind should not exist. This VW should essentially be zero because shift came almost near to zero. And this result famously came to be known as the null result. Now, this VW can be zero in two possible cases. One is that there is no ether medium itself. And the other possible explanation can be maybe there is some ether medium, but when the earth moves, this ether medium gets dragged along with earth. So it's like saying that uh, the layer of ether is sticking to the earth as a layer of salutate would stick to the earth if we wrap the earth with this salutate. So now to rule out one of these two possibilities, many experiments were again getting performed. And one such experiment was this stellar aberration experiment. Now we are not going to go into the quantitative details of the experiment. We will just look into it very qualitatively just to have a flavor of what was happening. So uh, where in this experiment, we had a setup in which we had a telescope, which was made to focus uh, to receive the rays of light from a star, from a very distant star. And it was kept so for a very long period of time. Now, if the case that ether gets dragged along with Earth is true, then as Earth keeps moving forward, the layer of ether that's sticking to the Earth, I mean getting dragged with the Earth, will also move forward, carrying along with it the rays of light traveling through it. In this situation, the ray of light should always reach the telescope no matter how much time passes. On the other hand, if there is no ether drag, if the medium ether is indeed stationary, or there is no medium called ether itself, whatever, in that situation, as the earth moves forward, the ether medium would be left behind along with its rays. So a time shall come when the rays of light from the star will no longer reach the telescope unless and until we change its orientation. So when this experiment was performed, the second case came out to be true. Now, this is really weird. We performed two experiments and two were giving real contradictory answers. Michelson Morley experiment said ether medium cannot be uh, stationary, it has to get dragged along with the earth if ether medium has to exist at all. Stellar aberration said, you know, ether medium cannot get dragged along with earth, it either has to be stationary or not exist at all. So both of them were kind of indicating to the direction that ethers does not exist, but these experiments were not enough to convince the scientists. So now scientists were coming up with a lot of quick fix laws in order to you know fix this results into their belief of existence of ether but none of them were kind of satisfactory and so this was going on and on and it was during this period of confusion then that einstein's paper in 1905 came to rescue so einstein published this paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies in 1905 and he started the paper with two very basic postulates. Uh, I call them basic because they were in fact well-established laws during that period of time. So he used those two laws as postulates and built up on it to write this entire paper. And he could successfully deduce that ether does not exist. How we will find that out. Before that, let's have a look 
into the two uh, postulates of Einstein. All right. So the first postulate is the theory of relativity. Well, yes, you heard it right. The theory of relativity was not at all given by Einstein. It existed from the times of Galileo itself. So what does this theory tell? This theory tells that the physical laws shall remain same in all the inertial frames. Again, I highlight oh, in all the inertial frames. This is important. This means the physical laws will not change as long as the frame that we are using to see them are moving with some constant velocity. And the second part of the, I mean, the second postulate states uh, that, okay, here's something is written like theory of constancy of light speed. I will simplify it down. It simply states that the speed of light is invariant in vacuum. And also the speed of light is not at all dependent on the, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I think your screen is lagging a bit. Okay. Uh, right now, which slide is visible? Uh, no, uh, the slide is perfect. Maybe the pointers in which you are pointing. So okay. that is, I think. connection i switch to some other phone or is it like okay is it tolerable uh, no i think it is like uh, not a big issue so i think it's it's done okay and apart from that uh, is my voice lagging or anything or is it fine no no your voice is perfect fine okay okay so if there is like the issue persists then again tell me okay then i'll see what else i can do okay yeah fine Okay, so now moving on to the second postulate, uh, which states that the speed of light is invariant in vacuum, uh, and that uh, the speed of light shall not get affected by the source that produces it. Well, the second part of the postulate that it doesn't get affected by the source that produces it is quite understandable because that's a property of wave and light being a wave simply follows it. And but the first part of the postulate, which says that the speed of light is invariant in vacuum, follows from the first postulate, that is the theory of relativity. Well, how? Let's have a look at it. If we say that the theory of relativity holds true, and we also consider Maxwell's equations as some physical laws, then Maxwell's equation should hold in all the initial frames. And the speed of light is equal to C is a consequence of Maxwell's equation itself. So as long as in the inertial frames, Maxwell's equations hold true, speed of light should remain C. This C in vacuum again. So this is how the second part of the postulate is kind of a follow up of the first postulate itself. So taking these two postulates into account, Einstein then started, like tried to uh, reach a conclusion with the concept of ether. Okay, before that, I want to mention one more thing that this uh, entire concept of special relativity holds as long as we are in the inertial frames of reference. Because whenever acceleration comes to the frame, we have to switch to general relativity. So this entire discussion of this entire lecture will be focused on inertial frames only. So let's move on. Now we come to the question, does ether exist or not? For that, we can imagine this situation in which we have a source of light and an observer. The source of light is sending light waves to the observer and in the first situation, we have the source traveling towards the observer with a velocity v. And since the observer is at rest, it sees the source coming to the observer with velocity v and the rays of light uh, coming to the observer with a velocity of c. Now, let's imagine a different case in which we have the source stationary 
and the observer moving towards the source with a velocity of v in this case if we now go into the frame of the observer which is still an inertial frame because the observer is not having any kind of acceleration in the frame of the observer we will still see the source moving towards the observer with a velocity v now if the first postulate has to hold uh, okay not the first postulate i mean if the second postulate which tells about the invariance of light speed has to hold true in its frame of in the frame of the reference of the observer as well then the only possible case is that we should not have any kind of medium why that's because if we have some kind of medium here then when the observer is moving and we are going to the frame of the observer to observe the situation then we will notice that the medium too will travel to us with the velocity v in that case the light wave that is traveling through the medium has to travel with a speed of c plus v because we know for a wave the speed of the medium through which it travels does account though the speed of the source which produces the light does not make any sense for the uh, wave so if we want to avoid the occurrence of this situation i mean the situation in which the speed of the wave becomes c plus v we have to agree with the fact that a medium cannot exist for light to travel with this argument very simply einstein reached the conclusion that since here expecting a medium ether is making things complicated it's for good that we should finally abandon it and here his philosophy of everything should be made simple as simple as possible and not simpler comes to light right so that's how finally we had done away with ether and this result also matched with the experiments i mean michelson's and, and morley's experiment stellar aberration and everything so kind of got verified as well but one interesting thing that i would like to share is that uh when einstein wrote this paper paper he had no idea that michelson and morley had performed such an experiment in which such and such result had come so he did it totally out of like based on his theory alone so it was not uh, you know experiment followed by some explanation rather an explanation that came out independently uh, without having any knowledge about the experiment so that's all i think i have been speaking for quite a long time now you all must be bored so let's have a look at this clip I've completely solved the problem. Uh, what are you talking about? Close your eyes. Pretend you're overlooking a train track. Imagine a train racing past faster than any train you've ever seen. Now I want you to imagine as the train is flying past, two lightning bolts crashing beyond the tracks at the same time, a hundred meters apart. So what? Patience. Now imagine that you're standing in the middle of the train during the exact same scenario. Would the lightning bolts be simultaneous? Of course. Not if light moves at one speed. Close your eyes. Oh, but this is ridiculous. Put yourself back on the moving train and really think about it. Do it, Michele. Now watch the lightning bolts. Were they simultaneous to you? No! Because you were moving towards one and away from the other. <laughs> to me. Now, before I switch on to the next slide, I want you all to react with some emoji. How many of you could get what happened in the clip? I mean, how many of you could understand what the clip was all about? Come on, just react with any of your favorite emojis. Okay, nice, great, great. Okay, so I see a lot of very well-educated people sitting with me. So I have to be careful with the lecture because you all know a lot, even more, a lot more than me. Okay, I'll try my best. Ah, uh, all right. So this is what we are going to look in next in the lecture. So let's keep moving. Okay. 
Now, before we could discover, you know, special relativity further, uh, I have to come to the clocks. You will see one clock in each and every slide of mine. This is because you know why. This is because this this theory of special relativity and clocks have a very deep bonding. So I cannot talk about special relativity without talking about clocks. So let's first handle clocks. Uh, so here uh, I'm going to explain the working of a light clock. Now, it was not necessary for me to particularly take a light clock. I mean, I could have taken any clock, some mechanical clock, electric clock, or I don't know what. But I prefer taking a light clock because it's convenient, because it's easier to explain with this. And whatever I will be blabbering about this light clock, I mean, whatever I will blabber after uh, explaining you the light clock, if that holds true for the light clock, it should hold true for all other clocks. I say this because uh, physical phenomena doesn't depend on the way we measure it, right? We can use anything to measure it. As long as our measurements are correct, it will hold true. So that's what, if whatever I say holds true for the light clock, it will hold true for any other Tom, Harry clock, whatever clock it is. So let's first understand the working of a light clock. Here we have, uh, here, uh, like I've not shown it here, but somewhere here there is a source which is giving out this light rays. Now that this light rays, okay, sorry. Yeah, so somewhere I have a source which is giving out this light rays. Now this light rays comes out of the source, moves to this upper reflector, gets reflected and then returns back to this detector. Now, after this light ray completes this one journey and hits the detector, we hear a tick. So each of this uh, journey of this light ray from the source and to the detector back uh, accounts for one tick. And this tick is what has uh, is being used as the smallest unit of measurement for measuring time. So depending on how many ticks occur, we are able to calculate time because uh, we know the distance between this uh, source and the reflector and say we call it L and we also know the speed of the light. So using this sticks, we will be able to measure the time elapsed. So this is the simple mechanism in which a light clock works. Now that we have learned about light clocks, let's play with it a bit. Look who's here. Here's Mr. Harry and Miss Granger. And we have uh, Miss Granger standing on a cloud with her light clock. And we have Mr. Potter on his broom with his light clock moving with a velocity Z. Now, let's see how they see their light clocks function and also how they see each other's light clock function. Okay, now if we look in the perspective of Miss Granger. Then in Miss Granger's perspective, Miss Granger's own clock is at rest. So she will see the light clock functioning in the exact same mechanism that I mentioned in the previous slide, that this light ray will go up and then return back. Also, uh, in the perspective of Mr. Potter, if he looks at his own light clock, then he, he will also see it working in the same mechanism because in his perspective, he is at rest. But now what will happen if we look at Mr. Potter's clock from Miss Granger's perspective? Then Miss Granger will surely see Mr. Potter moving. And so by the time the light ray that has been uh, emitted from the uh, source of Mr. Potter's clock reaches the reflector, Mr. Potter along with his light clock would have moved some distance. So for that reason, the light ray cannot travel a straight path and reach the reflector. It has to take this inclined path and reach the detector. And also by the time it reaches again back, it also has to uh, do so by following this inclined path because uh, Potter would have moved some distance by then. So if we now calculate the time taken for one tick in the perspective of Potter, uh, okay, uh, one thing I want to make it clear is that here when I say one tick, I am referring to one tick in Potter's clock. I mean, 
now i we are done with what is happening in ranger's clock so our main focus right now is on potter's clock itself so here potter's perspective of his clock uh, means that potter's perspective of one tick in his clock okay so for that one tick in potter's clock in potter's perspective will take how much time it will take 2l by c because this entire journey uh, has a has a uh, you know distance of 2l and the light is traveling with a speed of c so the time for one tick in potter's perspective is 2l by c now in granger's perspective the distance traveled by the light ray is not at all 2l it is something more and what it is we have to find out by using some basic geometry so uh if the time for one tick in granger's perspective is this delta t pg i mean uh time for one tick in potter's clock with respect to granger then this is the time uh through which potter has traveled with his velocity v so this distance that he covers in this time is equal to v times of this time interval and if we take out this triangle from here to this diagram we have half of uh, i mean this part is half of this entire distance so this is just v times of this time interval by 2 and so we have this arm of the triangle as l square plus this squared uh, square root simply by pythagoras theorem so the total distance that this light ray had to cover to reach back to its starting point is twice of this s so it's this one and therefore the time taken for one tick uh in ranger's perspective would be this distance divided by the speed of light now by doing a little bit of calculation we can find out that time for one tick in ranger's perspective comes out to be this now if you notice carefully you will see that the time for one tick in ranger's perspective is some factor times the time for one tick in potter's perspective right and this factor is what has been named as the lorentz factor so now you see the same clock appears in two different ways to the two observers so this is kind of giving us a uh, idea that in fact time as we normally perceive in our day to day life as absolute is not at all absolute in fact that is relative now if i talk for some time in perspective of miss granger i will say that see i will so i will say that my clock and your clock i mean harry's clock were working the same now after you started moving your clock has become slow and each tick in your clock is gamma times long is taking gamma times longer than before So according to Miss Granger, when Potter started moving, Potter's clock has slowed down. She says Potter's clock has slowed down because each tick in Potter's clock is now taking gamma times longer than before. So in perspective of the observer at rest, time got dilated for the moving observer. I think till now it's clear. Okay. Now returning back here, other another way of saying this is. now like listen very closely what i am saying because this is important and if there is some doubt i will just again you know uh, give you some time to react and please react and i will repeat it okay so right now i just said the time taking for one tick in granger's perspective for potter's clock is gamma times longer than the time taking that that uh, time for one tick in potter's clock when he was at rest so we can say that since a uh, one tick is used as a unit of measurement for measuring time if the unit of measurement used for measuring time is getting longer then the value that we will get on uh, using that unit to measure a time elapsed will become shorter okay a better way to explain this is suppose we are measuring a length of 10 meters with in units of 1 meter then we will get a value of 10 divided by 1 10 right but if we are measuring this 10 meter length 
in units of 2 meters, then we will get a value of 10 divided by 2, 5. So as I lengthened the unit of measurement of length, the value of length came out to be smaller. In that same way, since the unit of measurement uh, of time in uh, for the moving potter got longer in Granger's perspective, the time that Potter would measure will come out, uh, the time uh, like when Potter will measure some time elapsed, the value that he will get will be smaller as compared to the value that Miss Granger will get. That's what is shown here. This is the time elapsed in the perspective of Miss Granger. And that is gamma times longer the uh, time elapsed when measured by Mr. Potter. I mean, when the same time elapsed is being measured by Mr. Potter. So we can say in the frame of Granger, so in the frame of the person at rest, time elapsed for the moving person became gamma times shorter than the time elapsed for the person at rest. I think I confuse you all. If yes, then react. Otherwise, no need to react. Okay, so I see no reactions. I think I can carry on. Okay, someone reacted. So should I explain it again? If yes, then react again. All right, no. So I'm not repeating it again. So I'm just moving forward. All right. Now this expression is something very, very important if you want to go along in the rest of the lecture. So write it down, paste it down, do whatever you want, but just keep this expression with you. All right. Now that we are done with time and we now know that time is relative, let's try to find our out about length. Now, if you are trying to, okay, measure length, we have to first decide whose length we are going to measure. So in this particular case, we are going to measure the length of Harry's broomstick. And here we again have Miss Potter standing on her broomstick and sorry, Miss Granger standing on her broomstick and Mr. Potter traveling with a velocity V towards her. Now he is carrying two uh, light clocks. First, to record the time of the event when the front of his broom comes in line with the front of uh, Granger's broom. And this time he records as TP1 and Granger also records this as TG1. And then uh, he moves forward. And then when he uses the second clock to measure the time, when the back of his broomstick comes in line with the front of Granger's broomstick and he levels this time as TP2 and Granger levels this as TG2. Now, both Harry and Hermione are going to measure the length of his broomstick. And then we will try to see who measured it right or whatever they measured. Does that make sense or not? Let's look. Okay. Okay. So this is the length of Potter's broom in perspective of Potter. Now, in Potter's frame, we have Potter at rest. I mean, Potter will see himself at rest and he will rather see Hermione traveling to him with a velocity V. When that happens, when that happens, he will uh, record the time when Hermione's front end of her broom is in line with his uh, the front end of his broom as TP1. And the time when Hermione's uh, front end is in line with uh, his back end of his broom as TP2. So therefore, the length that Hermione has covered to travel from his first clock to second clock is V 
finds the difference between TT2 minus TT1. And this gives the length of Potter's broom in Potter's perspective. All right. Now, if we look into Hermione's perspective, uh, just as she had recorded the times as TG2 and TG1, and she is seeing Potter moving towards her. So she will simply say that, okay, Potter took this much time uh, to, you know, travel his entire uh, length of his broom uh, above me. So the length of his broom should be V times this time period. So we now have these two things. Now, just as in the previous slide, we had read about time dilation. By now we know that in the frame of the observer at rest, in this case, we are looking from Hermione's frame. If you look from Hermione's frame, then Hermione is the one who is at rest. So she will see that uh, Potter being the moving one will measure the time elapsed gamma times less than the time elapsed measured by her. And so we will use this transformation in the frame of Hermione, in the frame of Granger, because we made this observation assuming Granger at rest. So when we will put this here, we will see that the length of Potter's broom measured by Granger comes out gamma times the length of Potter's broom measured by Potter. Now let's look at the situation from Hermione's perspective once again. So she is saying, hey Potter, listen, when you started moving, your time got dilated in my frame. And when I apply the time correction factor in your measured length and compared into the length that I measured, I found that your measured length is gamma times contracted to my measured length. His measured length is gamma times contracted to her measured length. So in the perspective of the observer at rest, length got contracted for the moving person. I hope this is clear. So now we can generalize this by this equation. So length of the person at rest when seen in the perspective of the person at rest comes out gamma times length measured by the moving person. All right. Well, till now I spoke a lot. I explained why ether does not exist time dilation and then land contraction. And till now, I think many of you must have this, must be having this question or maybe not having this question because you all are too smart already. But at least for the first time when I read special relativity, I was like, hey, if all of this is happening, why don't I see the bike rider who is moving in his bike, you know, uh, experiencing some time dilation or length contraction and whatnot. I mean, why don't we see this, uh, results of special relativity in our day-to-day -day life well this is where we are we have been made a fool if we were imagining such a you know happening universe around us i mean not a happening universe i would say the more appropriate time is a more happening world around us that's because if we go back to lorentz factor we will see that this lorentz factor has in its denominator this term in which we have a ratio between V and C. And as long as our velocity is really small as compared to the speed of light, this gamma is essentially one. So there is basically no difference at all between uh, the moving person and the stationary person in terms of the time he measures or the length he or she measures. So, Lorentz factor essentially comes out to be one for all the physical uh, phenomena that we see in our day-to-day -day life. Okay, I should not be saying all the physical phenomena. I mean, at least the phenomena that is visible to our eyes. Now, to give an idea of this, I can give you an example that even the, like the jet that runs uh, fastest till now is known to have a velocity of something, say, 10 to the powers uh, 4 meters per second. That's the maximum that we could reach. Beyond that till now, it has not been possible. So it still is something 10 to the power 4 times smaller than the speed of, like order of the speed of light. So that's why we are not able to see the implications of special theory of relativity with our eyes. But there are cases in which 
this effects has been uh, you know detected one such case is in the case of uh, high energy uh, particles such as muons well uh, today i will not be going into that part of the talk but yeah that's all i can say and with that i guess we can have a break of next 10 minutes and during this period if anyone wants to ask any question can stay back and ask the question others can enjoy their break and also if there is some issue regarding sound or my explanation in general i mean if i am just messing it up a lot then please type in the chats so that i can rectify myself for the next half of the lecture okay just to rectify is there any net speed issue uh, i mean from my end or is it just uh, no, some i think it's perfect from your end okay uh, the recording of this lecture would be made available right anushka yeah yeah i'll share that okay okay fine so if someone is having some net issues i guess uh, they can think of referring to the lecture later i mean recording of the lecture later
Well, I am back. It's 11.40. So let's get started once again. I hope everyone is back too. All right. Now we are going to move to the more interesting part of special relativity. Now that we are done with the basics. Uh, till now, at least we had this idea that an event which is simultaneous should remain simultaneous for everyone. But now we are going to see something which is going to break this belief of ours. And just, you know, giving you some hint again, the first clip that I started with has got to do something with this uh, topic that I'm going to start right now. So here we are to the relativity of simultaneity. Now to understand this, we have again Potter on his train this time, he is now bored with his broomsticks. So he thought of doing something more modern. So he rode on a train and now he's moving with a velocity V. And on the track, there is Hermione who is uh, standing with her army of light clocks. Now, when she is exactly in the middle of I mean, exactly in line with the middle of Harry's train. At that point of time, uh, Harry emits two rays of light from the middle of the train. Each ray going to the opposite ends, I mean, to the respective ends of the train. And when this ray, rays of light will strike the clocks that are placed at the end, he will note the time. Now this is the setup and this is the thought experiment that you have to you know ponder on and think and try to find out what exactly will happen. So for that first let's try uh, like go to the frame of Harry and try to analyze the situation. So in Harry's perspective he's at rest and the train is also at rest because he's in the train. Now, he is sitting in the train and the train is at rest. And at some point of time, he has emitted two rays of light, which are traveling with the same speed C, one towards front and one towards the back. And they are uh, like traveling in order to strike uh, targets which are exactly at equal distance from the center. So in his perspective, the rays of light will strike both the clocks at the same time. And if he knows that time, he will find that this uh, time with respect to Potter of the front clock is exactly equal to the time with respect to Potter of the rear clock. And he will simply find this out to be this LP, if this is the entire like length of the entire train, then half of this divided by C. Okay, so for Potter, the event of the two rays of light striking the clocks respectively is simultaneous. So I repeat the event in which the two rays are striking the clocks in the frame of Mr. Potter is simultaneous. But what will Hermione say of this situation for her? Will this even be simultaneous? And if we now go to Hermione's frame, that is this track and try to see we can surely answer very confidently that no. This is because by the time the rays of light will reach the front or the rear clock, the train would have moved by some distance. And because of this, the ray of light that is traveling back will have to cover a distance that is less than the ray of light that is traveling front. Because now since the train has moved forward, this ray has to cover a longer distance. Well, this ray, has to come up, cover a smaller distance because in this case, both the ray and the train are traveling towards each other, resulting in a less distance to be covered. So naturally for Hermione, these two events, that is the events of the two rays striking the clocks are not at all simultaneous. She will see that the ray of light will strike the back clock before then the ray of light uh, will strike the front clock. 
So now let's go into the mathematics of it. Now that we understand that a simultaneous event for Harry became a non-simultaneous event for Hermione. Now if we go into this frame and try to calculate it, we will find that uh, the time taken for this ray of light to reach the back of the train will be the distance that it had to cover by the speed. So the distance here will be half of the length of the train minus the distance that the train has covered in this duration. And then we simply divide it by the speed. And we, we will reach this reading. All right. And then again, if we do the same thing for the ray that is traveling to the front, uh, this time the distance is half of the length of the train plus the distance that the train has traveled because now this ray of light has to travel some extra distance. So we have it here, this distance, and then we simply, uh, you know, divide it by the speed of the light and we are going to get this after, you know, solving all this. So on solving these equations, we will finally arrive in these two equations. So we can clearly see there is some time lag of the front event from the rear event. I mean, the event that is occurring at the rear end. And if we calculate this time lag, we will get this value to be something like this. Now, we have seen this entire thing in the perspective of Granger. And now when Granger will report this event to Potter, she will say, that, hey, Potter, you have gone nuts. The event that you are describing as simultaneous is not at all simultaneous. There is some time lag that is happening between the two events. You are the one who is lying. Now, Potter says, hey, how can you say that? If you don't believe, I will uh, click snapshots of the two clocks, that is the front clock and the rear clock, when the rays will hit them, and I will show you that measurement. And then you have to agree with this. So now, Granger says, OK. Uh, then when she sees the snaps that Potter sends her, she understands that, okay, there must be something wrong with Potter's clocks because I have like uh, seen the events occurring at two different times. Then if Potter is still getting the same time in his both clocks, this means that one of his clock is having some malfunction in it due to which he is getting this wrong times. So now she says that, hey, Potter, listen, there is some malfunctioning in your clocks. Your clocks are not at all synchronized. They are not showing the same time. In fact, it is your rear clock which is showing some extra time. And due to which you are seeing the same time in both the clocks when the rays are hitting the clocks. And Potter asks, what the hell are you saying? I have synchronized my clocks very well. Uh, then says, okay, then tell me what is the extra time that I am seeing? Give me some report at least. So then Granger sets out to, you know, convert this time lag in the, in the perspective of Potter. So here, in Granger's frame, we have Granger at rest and it's Potter who is moving. So the time elapsed measured by Potter will be I mean, in Granger's frame, we have uh, Granger at rest and Potter moving. So in the perspective of Granger, this equation will hold true if we look in Granger's perspective. So we will simply replace this time elapsed for Granger by gamma times time elapsed for Potter. And on doing so, we will reach here. After performing this transformation, we have moved on to Potter's frame of reference. Now next, whatever we do, we have to work in Potter's frame of reference. So now that we are in Potter's frame of reference, in his frame, it is Potter who is at rest and it is Granger who is moving. So while we apply this equation in case of in Potter's frame, we will place this TP. Okay, mm, I think we don't have to work with time anymore. Okay, we will work with length. So in Potter's frame of reference, when we are working, we will have Potter at rest. Therefore, we will place this LP here and LG here, and we will have that LP is equal to gamma times of LG. So we will simply replace this gamma times of LG by LP, and then we will reach to the equivalent time lag between the two clocks that Granger perceives when seen in the perspective of Potter. 
so for granger potter's rear clock will be ahead of the front clock by this time interval tp at least potter will perceive that granger is saying so all right so now we saw that an event which is simultaneous for someone may be non simultaneous for the other observer so even simultaneity is relative and in order to explain the snaps that the moving person takes the rest person has to consider that the moving person's clocks are not synchronized so from here we can conclude one more thing for potter the clocks were perfectly synchronized but for granger potter's clocks are not at all synchronized so even synchronization of clock is a relative thing the clocks may be synchronized in one frame of reference and still remain unsynchronized in some other frame of reference so from this we can draw these two conclusions that synchronization of clocks is also relative and also simultaneity of event is also a relative factor now i guess after this you all are in a position to explain the clip that i had shown at the beginning of this lecture uh, anyways i am going to take inputs from you all what all you have to say okay now we will be moving for some movie again i mean not a movie it's a very boring video a anyway. rocket is approaching a garage at a high velocity to the garage attendant the rocket appears shortened and he is convinced that it will fit into the garage so he closes both the front and the back door of the garage simultaneously however from the point of view of the rocket pilot the garage is shorter than the rocket and he assumes that the rocket will not fit into the garage and will therefore hit the far door that is simultaneously closing the explanation of the apparent contradiction in this reasoning is related to the relativity of simultaneity the garage attendant is convinced that he has closed the doors simultaneously but the pilot of the rocket concludes that the front door has been opened before the back door is closed and so the rocket will not strike either of them so i think the video gave you some idea about what this paradox is all about first of all let's start with what a paradox is well just one second yeah so a paradox is a situation in which we get some contradictory results and we are not able to decide which one is right so in the situation that uh, i like in the situation that was shown in the video the condition was that there was a rocket and for here suppose if we draw parallels of that video with this diagram we have a rocket which is 10 meters in length and we have again granger sitting on that rocket okay she is standing okay fine uh and there is this burn which is 8 meters in length and we have potter standing on it now according to okay one more thing i want to make clear this meet lens are like this 10 meter length is measured by granger who sees herself at rest and this 8 meter length is measured by potter who sees himself at rest okay so these are in their respective frames don't confuse that this is you know some general length or anything that's nothing it's just in the frame in which they they are seeing their vehicle or whatever their house at rest that's all okay so now in the perspective of granger she is at rest and it's potter who is moving so in granger's frame her rocket is of 10 meters and uh, potter's burn will appear even more contracted to her so she will see it even less than 8 meters and she will say potter hey potter my rocket will never fit into your burn but on the other hand potter will see himself at rest and he will see that it's granger who is moving and therefore he will see a contracted length of that i mean in his perspective her man is uh, rocket is contracted and therefore he will say that hey don't worry i am having a watch at both the rocket and my house and i am seeing that your rocket will finally completely fit into my bar so now harmani says that again you are arguing with me unnecessary show me some proof so for that in the video what they did was uh the man who was standing on that burn he 
decided that as soon as the uh, rocket will enter the burn and will be completely inside it or i can say just inside it he will simultaneously close the two doors and hence proving that uh the rocket fits into the burn but for our convenience in this situation what we have done is instead of you know doing this business of closing and opening doors we love our light clocks so we are again taking their help we have placed two light clocks and again we have a very beautiful dslr camera that we will use to take the snaps so as soon as the front end of the rocket will reach the back door of the burn we will take one snap and again when the back end of the rocket will reach the front door of the burn we will take another snap and then we will compare these two snaps and if both the light clocks are showing the same time that water will conclude that see i told you the rocket is exactly fitting into the burn all right so i guess the argument the contradictions that are there in this paradox is clear and also what we are going to do in order to check whether there is this this paradox is real or it's something we can easily explain with our known knowledge okay now let's have a look at the situation from potter's perspective so in potter's reference frame the length of the burn is 8 meters and the length of the rocket has to be calculated so in potter's frame again potter is the one at rest okay no for that thing we have to be careful a bit because that 10 meters was something that we had measured for granger in her frame of reference assuming her to be at rest so while applying this equation here we will keep the length of the rocket measured in granger's perspective in the rest part and for the uh, length measured by length of the rocket measured in with respect to potter in this part and we will get that this is gamma times less than the uh, less than 10 meters and this comes out to be 8 meters okay provided i missed out on mentioning some information all right here the rocket was moving with a velocity of 0.6 c this rocket is moving with a velocity of 0.6 c and from that if we calculate the gamma this comes out to be 1.25 now putting this gamma here we are going to get that the length of the uh, rocket in perspective of potter comes out to be 8 meters so it is visible that potter uh, the claim that potter is making that the rocket will fit into the burn with respect to him does make sense all right now let's calculate the time taken for the front door okay one more thing uh, when the rocket is entering into the burn that instant potter had set his front clock and back clock both of them at zero all right so now uh, the time taken for this front end of the rocket to reach the back door can simply be calculated by you know 8 meters divided by that is the distance that the rocket has to cover divided by the speed of the rocket and we end up getting 44.4 nanoseconds so when the back door will reach the front end of the rocket at that time the snap that potter will click will show a time of 44.4 nanoseconds this makes sense all right uh, so in why just the like not just the front door even the back door both of them will show a time uh, time of 44.4 nanoseconds because in the frame of potter both the clocks are synchronized both are showing the same time all right but now let's see what is happening in granger's perspective in granger's perspective things are much more complicated because for her she is seeing the length of the rocket as 10 meters and when she measures the length of the burn in her perspective we will have 6.4 meters again calculated by the same way uh, anyhow i'm describing it so uh, if this 8 meter length for the burn was what we had calculated in the frame of potter when potter was at rest so we will place that 8 meters here so then the length in perspective of ranger will be gamma times less than this length and so we will get a nice 6.4 meters here now just think the condition of ranger she is seeing that she has a rocket of 10 meter which has to we placed inside a house of just 6.4 meters how is even that possible in her wildest dream 
so this is a great difficulty for her and now on the other hand potter is showing her the photos and telling her to explain them so then harmony as we all know she is very witty she does a lot of brainstorming and finally finds out why potter is able to give this misleading clues so for doing so what she does is she simply first calculates the time that it takes for the back door okay now in harmony's frame the rocket is stationary it's the burn who is moving towards the rocket with a velocity of 0.6 c so the time that the back door of the rocket will take to reach the front end of the sorry the back door of the burn will take to reach the front end of the rocket will be 6.4 meters divided by the speed of the burn and we get it to be 60 uh, okay 35.6 nanoseconds all right now this is the time equivalent in granger spring but now she has to explain this entire thing to potter for that she has to calculate the time equivalent in potter's spring so to do this what potter uh, what she will do is she will say okay now when i was at rest i got this time to be this but potter will perceive this time as gamma times less than my calculated time so he will see something as 28.4 nanoseconds but even after putting so much of brain she couldn't get that 44.4 nanoseconds so she again sits still and tries thinking why is this happening and then finally it clicks to her that maybe the claim of potter that his clocks are synchronized is a very wrong claim that is not at all true so then she remembers the lesson that i just taught right now in the simultaneity of uh, events and then she realizes okay for me since potter is moving his rear clock has to head his uh, front clock by some time interval so that it appears to him that they are showing the same time for two different events then she applies this correction factor here and she gets 16 seconds and now when she adds both of them she is able to explain why, why potter will still get a time of 44.4 nanoseconds in both the clocks in spite the two events happening separately so after all this explanation i think it is kind of clear how this paradox is not exactly an paradox because we are able to explain it quite well with the theory of special relativity what's happening here is that what potter is perceiving as a simultaneous event that is the two clocks showing the same time is not at all simultaneous in harmony's frame therefore if now we are done with the light clocks and go back to the situation in the video for potter both the doors were closed simultaneously and still he found the rocket inside the burn so that was his explanation but when we try to explain the same thing in granger's perspective she will say no both of your doors were not at all closed simultaneously by the time you closed the front door you had already opened the back door so in that time difference the rocket already came out through the other end of the door and therefore my uh, like your doors did not crash with my rocket so this is the explanation that they are giving so i guess this paradox of pole and burn is quite clear to everyone if not please react all right i guess it's clear okay then we will move on to the next paradox now this is the twin paradox and yes this is the most famous paradox that we come across in all the insta reels and youtube videos because it's quite amusing and now we are bored with granger and potter so we finally bid them goodbye and now we are here with fred and george so now fred and george were living very comfortably on earth but one fine day fred decides that he is bored with earth and thinks that it's finally time for him to do some space exploration 
so he sets out on his spaceship and travels to the purple planet far far away and then returns back to earth during this entire time george is there waiting for his brother to return and while all of this is happening in george's frame it's fred who is moving and therefore time is getting dilated for him and therefore less time is getting elapsed in for fred as compared to for george therefore when fred returns back to earth george says that i have become older than you and you have remained younger but in now if we try to look at things from fred's frame we will see that in fred's frame it is george who is moving and fred is at rest so according to fred it is george who is moving so less time should elapse according to george i am in for george and therefore when he is back it is george who should be younger and fred should be older but now in reality only one thing can happen so what is reality here who will become older both of them cannot become older at the same time one will be younger so what is the case what has happened who is telling the truth and who is lying we have to find this all out and for that we need to understand the two paradox well now to have a full proof test of this entire thing again george does something like he places two clocks one at earth and one on the purple planet and both of these clocks belong to george itself okay and what he says is again that okay in order to prove my point i am going to click snaps first when you are setting out from earth next when you reach the purple planet and next again when you return back to earth so we, we are going to have a series of uh, snapshots and then we will use this times to verify how much time passed for you for me and then we will finally find out who is younger who is older and all so in george perspective this purple planet is 3 light years away from earth and it's fred who is traveling with a speed of 0.6c towards the purple planet and if we put this values and you know calculate the gamma we will get it to be of 1.25 so in george's analysis if we calculate the time taken by fred to reach this purple planet it will be 5 years so 5 years would have passed by the time fred reaches the purple planet and if we think this like as we can observe also that this situation of going from earth to purple planet is symmetric to the situation of coming from purple planet to earth so in that case i mean symmetric in terms of the time elapsed in the frame of george so you will say that okay so by the time you return back to earth 10 years would have passed for me but in but for you i know time has got dilated therefore you will see a less time has got elapsed and if i calculate this time uh, elapsed in, for you i will simply divide this 5 years by gamma which is 1.25 and i will get a fold so in my perspective for you only 8 years would have passed by the time you return back to planet so you will be younger and i will be the older one all right and as a evidence as i just said that uh, he is going to click a picture when fred reaches the purple planet he clicks it and if the clock was first set to zero both of them when he set out then by the time he reaches there this clock will read 5 years that's what we have here but now if we try looking at it in fred's perspective things are kind of mysterious why let's have a look at it so in fred's frame it is fred who is at rest and we have this earth and the purple planet at some distance and it is this entire system with george standing on this uh, planet earth which is moving which is kind of sliding away with this 0.6 c velocity until fred strikes the planet all right and in fred's perspective even the distance between the two is no longer 3 light years 
will change as we know for the moving observer this feels okay moving observer with respect to george this distance will be contracted this length will be contracted and we will obtain this simply by dividing 3 light years by gamma and we will end up getting a 2.4 light years distance now according to fred the time that will be taken by this purple planet to reach him will be this divided by the speed with which the purple planet is traveling that is 0.6c and we will get a time of 4 years now this 4 years is in the frame of fred itself but remember we are making the measurements i mean we are at least looking into the measurements that are made by george so we have to convert this to the equivalent of george frame for that fred will say hey listen to me i am the one who is at rest and you are the one who is moving so my 4 years will be perceived by you as gamma times less than this 4 years and that will come out to be 3.2 years so for you this period of time is 3.2 years but again we are missing out something and what is that by now i guess you all have realized it is this lagging factor of the rear clock like the system is traveling in this direction so this is the front clock and this is the rear clock so this is the lagging factor of the front clock from the rear clock and the front clock from the rear clock will lag by 1.8 years so when we are looking at the rear clock we have to add this time to our calculated period of time so on doing so we will end up getting 5 years so now even fred is able to explain why george is getting this snapshot of 5 years and again on repeating you know changing direction and repeating it it is in fact fred's uh, sorry george's perspective that is coming out to be true it is george who will become older and fred will remain younger but still one confusion remains if law of relativity is symmetric if this law of simultaneity and everything is symmetric no matter from whose perspective we see why is it that fred remained younger and george became old and not the other way around there is some thing missing there is some confusion that we are creating or something that we are assuming wrong well this is where i made you a fool in saying that we can actually look at the situation from fred's perspective this is because just if i go back to my first slide i can show you that i had said a very important thing which was inertial things einstein's entire concept of special relativity works on inertial frames as soon as the frame stops being inertial special relativity fails and we have to take the help of general relativity now in case of fred till he was going to the planet purple everything was fine but when he went to the planet purple and he turned to return back this turning had some requires some acceleration right so you cannot turn without accelerating and you are here you are changing the direction of your speed so there is a change in velocity and the change in velocity means there is acceleration in fred's frame so analyzing the situation from fred's frame doesn't make sense also whatever result fred is expecting by considering that uh, for him special relativity will hold true is also anomalous so erroneous uh, actually so we have to depend on george's perspective if we want to explain things within the boundaries of special relativity now george is in an inertial frame since his velocity is not changing throughout this entire journey this entire duration when all of this is happening and he can assume like okay fred was moving there he slowed down very slowly and then he again changed it very i mean changed this uh, direction of his velocity very rapidly and turned around to reach earth so somehow i can still fit him in my frame because my frame is perfectly inertial and that's why whatever i will interpret with special relativity will be true so in this way we can say that if there is someone who leaves 
our planet on uh, her on his or her spaceship then by the time that person returns the one who was staying on earth would have aged more as compared to the one who was on the spaceship and it was exactly on this thing that in interstellar how we can explain how this father and daughter duo ended up became becoming this father and daughter duo so i think things were pretty much this that's all i had to say now uh, if there's anything that you did not understand in twin paradox please react okay if there is not then i think we can be like open to questions whatever you have to ask please raise your hand and start asking 